Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 FM, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist, anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting from occupied Saligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from people, projects, and struggles around the world engaging in the long project toward liberation. You can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or at protonmail.com, or send us letters at P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm is a locally owned co-op specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week, I spoke with John from the Working Class History Collective and host of the Working Class History Podcast. We spoke about the new book that WCH has published through PM Press, their archives, methodology, the project of popularizing working class movement and human-sized history, and a bunch more. You'll be able to find a transcription of this chat soon up on our website for free as a downloadable zine or unimposed PDF. More info on Working Class History at their website, workingclasshistory.com, as well as on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook in a growing number of languages. If you thirst for more conversation with John, you're in luck because Firestorm Books will be hosting a presentation with him about the book on February 25th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time or UTC-5. You can find out more at firestorm.coop slash calendar. And now some housekeeping. As an update on our transcription project, we've sent out our first batch of zines to Patreon subscribers over $10. Much thanks to everyone who's contributing at whatever level. We're still about $75 short of covering our basic minimums for the transcription costs and podcasting fees. So if you think you can become a sustainer, please consider visiting patreon.com slash TFSR. If you don't like the Patreon, that's fine. We can receive ongoing donations through LibraPay or PayPal as well as one-time donations via PayPal or our Venmo. And we have merch for sale up on our big cartel store. If you don't have cash, but you want to help out our project, that's awesome. But you can reach out with show ideas. You could tell some of your friends in Meet Space or on social media. Rep our content. You can print out some of the zines and send them into prisoners. You can rate us on podcasting sites, translate our work now that it's being transcribed. Or if you have a community radio station in your area that you want to hear us on, get in touch and we'll help you. You can find some notes about that on the broadcasting tab as well, where you can find more information about the weekly 58-minute FCC-friendly episodes that are available for broadcast on the airwaves in the so-called U.S. So our comrade Sean Swain continues to be denied regular access to communications with the outside by the Department of Corrections of Ohio, as well as that of Virginia, where he's currently being held. It's also notable that his main website has gone down. Sean is complaint pending before the Inter-American Human Rights Commission for the torture that he suffered at the hands of the state of Ohio. He's also collecting support letters for his bid for clemency. You can find out more details on Instagram by following Swainiac1969 or by checking our show notes for that link couple of notes from the A Radio Network, which include the latest episode of Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World by the A Radio Network has just been released. You can find it by visiting the site a-radio-network.org and by clicking the link for Bad News episodes. This month, you'll hear calls for support for the evicted Rog Squat in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, prisoner and prisoner solidarity updates from Greece, excerpts from a discussion of Russian anarchists about the current protests across the country and about Alexei Navalny, and a short piece highlighting the 100th anniversary of the death of notable anarchist author, thinker, scientist, and much more, Peter Kropotkin. Also, you're invited to join the A Radio Network on Saturday, February 13th from 1400 until at least 2000 o'clock Central European time. That's uh, 2 p.m. till 8 p.m. Or if you're in the Eastern time zone where we are, which is uh, UTC minus six, it's from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. for this sixth transnational live broadcast of anti-authoritarian and anarchist radios from deep within where anarchy reigns. Since 2016, this has been an important part of our yearly gathering of the A Radio Network. Due to the pandemic and strong restrictions given by governments all over the world, this year's gathering was forced online. But don't worry, 
Against all odds, we will nonetheless join together online on February 14th to broadcast an international show full of interesting contributions and discussions with and from comrades based in various parts of the world. And you, dear listeners, are, of course, invited. It would be very boring and useless otherwise. So far, our topics will include international experiences of prisoner resistance, anarchy in the time of COVID, far right-wing threats, and experiences organizing mutual aid. The show will be carried by a transnational and militant spirit, which hopefully is highly infectious, and we promise that our bad anarchist jokes are not lethal. You'll find a more detailed schedule, a player for the show, and a link to the live stream soon at A minus radio. <coughs> a minus radio. <coughs> I'm even allergic to radio. A minus radio minus network.org. And if you'd like to participate, you can reach out to member projects that are listed on that same site. Would you please introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, and any projects you affiliate with for the purpose of this conversation? Hi, I'm John He, and I'm host of the Working Class History Podcast. Would you tell us a bit about the Working Class History Project, how it got started, who all's involved, and, and why you started it? Yeah, basically, it came out of some um, discussions that I have with some friends uh, a few years ago. We'd been involved in lots of different kind of activist groups and stuff over the years and publishing projects and stuff like that and involved in different campaigns. You know, myself, um, I spent most of my time organizing at work and things like that. And social media is obviously a really powerful tool. And we were thinking about how could we try and put out information, kind of radical sort of information on social media in a way that would go viral. And we'd also got kind of very interested in reading about the history and learning about past struggles because the more we kind of did organizing ourselves and were involved in social movements and, and things like that, the more it kind of gets a bit sort of frustrating on one level, you know, seeing in kind of general mainstream society there's so little connection that most people have especially people of our generation and, and younger have with all the kind of i said the mass kind of working class oppositional counterculture which used to exist especially like you know in in the uk where i'm from you know that that you know for, for most of us we don't have that organic link with the past anymore you know where there'd be kind of generations of union families and and things like that in certain communities and so we we wanted to think like how can we try and you know not not bring that back kind of immediately but but draw that link with the past and at the same time on the kind of if you want to call it the left or whatever or the workers movement or you know whatever term you call for it is also kind of you know thinking that that so many people kind of get involved in stuff you know it kind of each new generation gets involved in stuff and they repeat the mistakes of the of, of people that came before them and things like that so also just thinking about you know how can we kind of try and like learn from these struggles in the past and try and help get these lessons to kind of new generations of workers and activists that, that crop up every um, generation um, and then yeah so we thought you know, people seem to like anniversaries. <laughs> so let's do that. And um, so we started doing that on social media and we were hoping that it would be kind of viral. And it it kind of, yeah, was, was a lot more successful than we thought in that. Because I guess for people who are like a bit lefty or whatever, um, seeing a post on social media about something that happened on this day, it, it gives them an opportunity to kind of share something with friends, colleagues and stuff in a way that doesn't seem kind of random because it is about something that happened today. So it's not just like I'm lecturing all my work colleagues and family about, um, you know, the, the, the Paris Commune of 1871 or whatever, because, you know, I, I want to, you know, it's like, oh, this is a historical thing that happened today. This is interesting. And you might find it interesting too, you know? So, and I think it kind of worked in, in that way because it does give a kind of organic and nice way of sharing information without kind of being a bit fun and without kind of being preachy or lectury or whatever. Um, so that's kind of where it came out of. And then as the projects got bigger and stuff, we just kind of started 
trying to do other things like a podcast to look into a bit more detail because you know sometimes we get comments and stuff on the on posts being like oh you know this doesn't have a lot of background in it or like you know this should really this should really have a bit more detail it's, it's like it's a social media post you know it's not it's, it's not a phd thesis or something um so you know we we recognize that um so we wanted to look into stuff into a bit more detail so we can do that in the podcast and um you know for people who don't like looking at stuff online and want to have a more of a reference work we've we've done a book now i'd like to i'd like to talk about the book i think it's Oh, one thing that you described in there is not a thing that I've ever experienced growing up in, I guess, middle class community in, in the United States is a, a knowledge or an expectation or an experience of what a multi-generational working class feeling is. And I, I mean, there's a thing of like, I have tons of friends growing up who were working class, but I think that a thing that you're describing and that your project is kind of building towards is a little bit different and a little bit something that I'd love to hear if you have any more like insights into how it's been described to you, the sort of like edges that you've danced around in trying to create it and what a working class culture in the UK where you grew up, for instance, felt like. What delineates that from just the experience of people who are poor and working and trying to get by? I grew up in the Southeast of England, which is one of the places where the erosion of kind of sense of working class identity has really been a very successful, you know, especially with policies brought in by Margaret Thatcher's conservative government um, and onwards. The major industries where workers were best organised uh, and most militant were systematically divided up and then defeated one after another first with the mine workers uh, then with the print workers also around the same time period steel workers and um, shipping workers defeated as well and then later dock workers and so that was one side of it and then what another side of it was around housing where social housing was attacked and um, instead right to buy was introduced which gave working class people the ability to buy their own council house which was uh, especially in the southeast of england where i'm from massively successful at converting what was a relatively large group of working class people who mostly were kind of labor voters and identified in the, in that line of things it was very successful at turning that kind of collective sense of identity into a mass of atomized individuals who can do better for them because, you know, buying your own council house was uh, a move which did help those individual people who, who did it significantly. Um, and that was kind of the, the, that, that was the area that I sort of grew up in amongst a lot of people where that had happened. So their families had, you know, bought their own home and, and then had a sense of themselves as very kind of middle class mostly kind of conservative individuals striving to do the best for themselves that they could. So I, I, I'm one of the people from that generation that had no connection with these kind of working class oppositional cultures um, that I just learned about later when I got into kind of uh, lefty ideas and radical politics and stuff. Would you mind talking a bit about the book that you all just published through PM Press and sort of the process that you went through of compiling it and and what do you hope as as a project that this book will will spark or will will bring out in people the idea for the book came out of um, our discussions with our publishers pm press who are a great independent uh, radical publisher and um, who contacted us to see if we'd be interested in doing a book because we hadn't really thought about it we were doing social media posts and then the podcast and we'd been involved in some print publishing in the past but it was a huge amount of work <laughs> and that kind of put us off the whole um put us off the whole thing but uh, yeah pm talked us into it um, and we were excited to do it because you know on, on a personal level like i love books books are great um and kind of doing one is great yeah so <laughs> um and also like even say for people who follow us on social media because of the large amount of other people are putting up posts and algorithms and whatever people won't see everything that we put out you know most of the time only a fraction of a percent see that any see anything that we 
that we put out. And also because of algorithms, certain posts get much more prominent than others. So especially things that are more about countries where more of our followers live, like the US, that stuff gets a lot more engagement and then a lot more people, a lot more people see it. So people who even do follow us on social media might get a kind of very narrow view of the kind of historical events that we have in our archive. And also, of course, a whole bunch of stuff there aren't photos of, there aren't pictures. And in this book, we do have a lot of photos. We've got over 100 photos. But we've also been able to feature a lot of stories from our archive where there are no images that exist. So we can't put them on social media. So, yeah, we wanted to put something out um, for people who enjoy consuming content in a different medium. And also to have more as a reference that you can flip through without having to look at a screen or whatever. And it was exciting to be able to think of putting together in terms of a whole, creating as a, as, as, as a whole thing. So taking a random selection of, of everything that we post over a whole year instead of what we normally do, which is, you know, every day we think we post a couple of things or whatever. Um, so so it, was, it was good to kind of think like, well, we've got 366 days out of the year and these are the countries that we've got events about and we want to feature them, the biggest amount of countries and have the most diverse range of stories possible uh, with respect to gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, um, and that sort of thing. And with the idea of the book being as diverse as our classes, uh, we acknowledge in the introduction to the book that we have made a lot of efforts in this regard, but we still have uh, a long way to go due to the nature of the kind of bias of the sources available to us, which are disproportionately about white guys in, in more developed Western countries. And um, so, you know, most of our research over the past few years has been um, trying to, you know, find out and uncover stories about different parts of the world. But, um, uh, but, but even that is tricky because of language stuff and even knowing what you can kind of Google and things like that so um but while we've still got uh, you know a way to go we are still pleased at the range of different types of stories that we feature Asheville FM is a listener-supported volunteer-run Freeform Community Radio. Asheville FM relies on underwriting revenue and listener contributions to keep the lights on and the sounds flowing to you. A tax-deductible contribution can be made at any time simply by visiting our homepage at www.ashevillefm.org and clicking the donate link. A one-time contribution can be made, or better yet, sign up to become a sustaining member with a monthly donation. Thank you for your support, and thank you for listening. I mean, it's quite the tome, and it's it's been remarked upon before, like, how much of it. So, like, two events out of every date out of the year, including the February 29th, which, thank you from the Leap Year Babies. And then, like, uh, I appreciate the fact that there's an index in the back, because there's a thing to be said about the way that we think about information and that we categorize it if your main impetus is, like, what is the day today? what else has happened on this registered day in history can be kind of, in some like happy ways, it's a bit lackadaisical. You're not going to be flipping from one page to the next and saying, well, then what happened after the workers rose up or after the Soviet tanks came in or after like the British military massacred people in Kenya? It's it's interesting to just sort of get these little bite-sized morsels of history. And it seems to kind of invite the reader to embark on a journey of research on their own afterwards and sort of build the the context for themselves as to why this is like important build an understanding and maybe build a wider um networks with folks that were more directly affected by those historical events yeah that's what we hope people do like we we list all, all the sources that we use um for each of the posts in the back so that we do hope that if people see something that is interesting to them they will go and look into it further because in our stories we don't try and tell people what they should take from them or what they should think because of them we you know we don't want to tell people what to think or anything like that you know obviously we have a perspective there's a reason that we've put these stories in here but yeah we want people to be able to read these stories and then yeah look into them further if they want and and um, figure out for themselves what what the relevance is for them, their lives, and any kind of struggles that they're involved in. Class has a lot of meanings 
when it comes from different voices. And we've kind of talked a little bit about your experience and basically with how class had been experienced by some people in the, the part of the world that you had, had grown up in. But can you talk a bit for the purpose of this project, which I think was started by people in various parts of the world and not just in like the UK, for instance. Can you talk about the standard that used to determine something in the book or in the social media posts or in the podcast or someone that is falls within the parameters of what working class is and why is it important to view it as a position of agency yeah i think there's so many different ways that you can talk about class and they all have some validity but for us what's important is we don't use it as a system for classifying individuals for us our interest in it is as a political tool which is how can we best understand society and how can we then use that understanding in order how to change it and we think that class is a really essential tool in understanding that especially living as we do in capitalist society so capitalist society is based on the dispossession of the majority of the world's population you know we are dispossessed of means of production so land factories, workplaces, etc. We're dispossessed of that so that either by enclosures in European countries and by colonialism pretty much everywhere else, we're dispossessed of that and therefore we have to work for a wage for people who do own means of production, who do own land, factories, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of the defining feature of capitalist society and and that's that's our broad understanding of class and how we use it is is so the defining feature of working class for us is this dispossession and then the requirement to either work for another or you know if you can scrape by on state benefits if your government provides benefits or petty crime or whatever else you have to do so you know some people use it and i think in in everyday parlance in the uk it's much more of a cultural thing so what what class someone says they have is often more to do with someone's accent than anything else so you know the kind of british version of donald trump the guy who hosts the apprentice tv show he's a don't know if he's a, he's probably not a billionaire. He, he's a very he's a really rich business owner called Alan Sugar, but you know he sees himself as working class because his background is that's his background and that's like his accent. And you know he can think that, and that's you know that's fine. That's one sort of interpretation of it, you know. But for you know for our perspective, he's an employer, and his 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 wealth is from <laughs> exploiting the people that have to work for him because we don't own businesses so um obviously in, in the u.s there's there's even different you know there's all kinds of different ways people have a talk about class like in in the u.s unions mostly talk about the middle class talk about being being middle class um because because of struggles over the past hundred plus years a good number of people in blue collar jobs have been able to improve their conditions to the point where they can have a decent standard of living because of the struggles they've had so th- there's a lot of kind of union talk in the US of unions defending the middle class, blah, 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 you know, which which is kind of funny, really, especially from a UK perspective where middle class normally means kind of like posh people that like films with subtitles and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we use it as, yeah, not about um, classifying individuals, but about understanding and, and changing society. So for example... In our archive, we have stories about Oscar Wilde, the author and poet and libertarian socialist. And, you know, sometimes people will say things like, he wasn't working class, but, and it's like, yeah, fair enough. But his political ideas and the kind of world that he wanted to create was one in which working class people were in control of society and were really made, able to make the most of our lives and, you know, live vibrant, free, beautiful lives. And so that's the thing that interests us the the most that that for us is the key thing there are examples in the book that do not take place directly within the framework of the means of production and employment you point to the intersections between the dispossession and the wielding of 
state religious or social power against populations that are marginalized, whether by ethnicity, religion, gender, sexuality, place of birth. Can you can you talk a little bit about that that widening too of the framework of working class? Because I'm sure I'm sure there's some people that are some pretty strict Marxists or workerists out there who are of the perspective that, well, that's all fine and good, like, but that is not working class. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons that we specifically chose the name that we did, as opposed to something more kind of populist, like People's History, a la Howard Zinn, a historian who's a big influence on us. Uh, because those kind of vulgar, if you, you know, want to call themselves Marxists or, or workerists or whatever, are a problem. <laughs> People who, while they kind of talk progressive talk about, you know, overhauling society and building a new type of world, what they often kind of mean in a lot of ways is that they mean that for kind of white male factory worker type people and everyone else like women or black people or indigenous peoples should pretty much be quiet and stop being divisive in quotes um, until the revolution and then all the other problems can be sorted out in hunky dory and um, we think that is pretty terrible in short not only from a moral perspective but also it's completely counterproductive and it's it's a misunderstanding of what class is while these people may often criticize what they see as identity politics which is in most cases, is just people in oppressed groups fighting for their own self-interests. They, in fact, are adopting a crude identity politics of their own on the identity of being working class, which they normally also see as excluding other types of identities. And class doesn't exclude other identities. It overlaps and intersects with, with all other identities. Obviously, most trans people are working class most other lgbt people are working class and the vast majority of the world's working class are people of color and they're located primarily in uh, the global south and every other type of oppression and exploitation overlaps and intersects with class you know for example things like abortion wherever you are in the world whatever the laws are generally if you're rich you can get an abortion if you need one whereas if you are poor, you may not be able to get one even if it's nominally legal where you are. So things like abortion rights are in, you know, are inherently part of a class conflict, class struggle. So abortion rights is, is just one kind of example. All other types of um, oppression, you know, racism, homophobia, transphobia, all that sort of thing is, is very much linked to um, class. And any single part of our class fighting for our own, own interests benefits all of us because these kind of workerist type people who who would say that you know struggles of women workers against the pay gap is is a sectional you know is a sectional thing not in the interest of a the class of, of a whole say they don't have that same perspective when workers in one industry go on strike or in or one employer go on strike for a pay increase because they rightly recognize in that case that a victory for, for one group of us is a victory for all. And it's exactly the same with different sections of the working class divided up by any other kind of arbitrary characteristic. Things like, you know, the super exploitation of migrant workers or particularly oppressed racial groups, the, the low pay for black workers in many countries, fighting against that kind of specific racism exploitation raises the the bar for everyone so there's not the kind of constant race to the bottom um, in terms of paying conditions where employers can use us to undercut one another so we thought that was really important to get across and and also you know point to historically that often it has been the most oppressed and the most underpaid workers who who have been at the forefront of organizing for better paying conditions not like some kind of populist lefties try to say about migrant workers being used to undercut good union jobs or, or, or what have you but more often than not you know migrant workers are really at the forefront of workers struggle kind of fighting for better paying conditions and have been um through history whether it's you know people like 
agricultural laborers in the United States or whether it's people like cleaners in, in London, uh, England right now leading so many struggles and obviously historically in the US kind of women textile workers were often kind of forgotten about but you know women textile workers were the first group of workers who properly organized in factories and and took strike action and and you know in the south black agricultural workers and workers in industries like logging and mining were central and leading in organizing and fighting for better paying conditions which benefited everyone including the white and male workers who you know often tried to exclude women or black people from their unions so i'll totally admit that i haven't read the book cover to cover and the intro says that i don't have to so i can just kind of pick it up whenever and say like i wonder what happened on june 15th But I am looking forward to continually reading portions as the days pass. I'm noticing a libertarian bent to the stories that are told. For example, I haven't seen any acts of state uh, by so-called worker states uh, represented as working class events in the book. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, our approach is kind of summed up in, 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 in our slogan, which is on the back of the book and on our social media accounts. And that's history is not made by kings, politicians or a few rich individuals. It's made by all of us. So that's kind of the perspective we're coming from. So the acts of politicians and governments isn't particularly interesting to us um, because we're believers in the principle that the emancipation of the working class is the task of the working class itself. And that was one of the rules of the first international, the, the first big kind of international socialist organization. And that's our view of things, that the thing that drives history is not yeah, it's not the actions of governments, politicians, or the powerful. It's the everyday actions, often really small and unnoticeable by millions, hundreds of millions, billions of us. So that's what we focus on. Although we do feature some kind of events which have been done in our name, so that have been done by governments which call themselves representatives of the working class, where because we think that as well as learning from successful struggles and stuff in the past, we should also learn from our mistakes where terrible crimes have been committed in the name of the working class. So some of the things we include are things like the Soviet Union recriminalizing homosexuality, which was decriminalized during the 1917 revolution. And then in the 1930s was was recriminalized. And that led to the huge numbers of gay and bisexual men being sent to the gulags to labor camps to um, suffer horribly and that was done in the name of the working class and fighting fascism so you know we think it's important to remind ourselves of these things that you know while those of us who who say we want a new world our ideas are kind of beautiful ideas in a lot of ways and you know that we want to create a great world where (laughs) where there's a lot more happiness and joy than than, than we have now and, and a lot less suffering. But it's important to bear in mind that having these lofty ideas in our heads doesn't always mean that that's how they work out in practice. And um, we should be constantly vigilant not to think that, that the ends justify the means when it comes to certain things. You talk some about the limitations of the project in the introduction, such as the limit of two events represented for each day. Uh, You also mentioned where you're starting from, the types of events that you're aware of, and linguistic factors that determine the scope of what you could include. But can you talk about this work in in your project in the social media or in the archives, Uh, the work of translating your social media posts on the days of history, or if you've had success through translation to bringing histories that were formerly out of your reach into that wider fold of your project. Can I check, do you mean translating stuff from other languages into English, or do you mean vice versa? Into English is what I meant, mm-hmm. um, to bring it to your existing audiences, mm-hmm. but also uh, I would imagine that there's a give and take when it comes to the fact that you're now doing translations in Arabic uh, and, and other languages, and it seems like you're kind of trying to expand that framework. Oh. Is that right? Yeah, we are very fortunate in that um, a number of people have got in touch and have launched sister pages, essentially, of working class history in other languages. So at the moment, there's WCH sister pages in um, Arabic, Farsi, Portuguese, Spanish, French, Norwegian, 
um, Swedish, and uh, the latest one is Romanian, which is really cool and really exciting to see. Some of those groups also are, are researching their own events and writing up their own um, history more about their part of the world. So the Farsi page has a lot of stuff about uh, Iranian radical history, which is really fascinating. And the Arabic page as well about the Middle East. And that's that's great because that's teaching us a bunch of stuff that we didn't know. And the Portuguese lot as well are writing a load of great stuff, not just about Portugal, but about uh, especially about struggles in former colonies like uh, Brazil, Angola, um, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau. So that's really great for us. And um, in terms of us finding out things, because, yeah, as I said, when we first started the social media page, we kind of got a few kind of radical history calendar type things and, and went through and wrote some stuff up. But the, the ones that we found were massively kind of US and uh, Western Europe and male centric. So like I said, the majority of the time we spent looking up new things have been to try and diversify that and kind of correct the bias and imbalance that was in it right from the beginning. And um, for doing that, not that I want to give uh, any big corporations any praise, but I love Google Translate so much. It's such an amazing tool that, um, you know, it can do pretty decent passable translations from so many languages um, into English. So, so we do use that kind of a fair bit to find out about things. But the problem with it being that if writing about something is only available in a language that you don't speak, you wouldn't even necessarily know to look something up there unless you had knowledge of it in the first place, which you might not have if it wasn't in English. If you see what I mean, so it's it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit chicken and egg. But basically, when we find out about something in a in a country or place that we haven't heard of, we can kind of use that as an entry point, and then read things about it and use Google Translate, and then that references other things which we can then look up. So we kind of go down rabbit holes. Uh, it's kind of a sort of quite a fun way to like nerdy, but fun way to spend an afternoon, like um, you know, going down a rabbit hole. I, I did that kind of recently just reading up various things about struggles by Japanese students and things in the 1960s and 70s. I'm sure that there's lots of stuff that has been written about all kinds of stuff by people in, in academia at some point or by students at different universities or whatever. That's not the background that, that we at WCH come from. But, you know, we wouldn't even know if any of that stuff exists because most stuff that's written for academia is then just never heard from again by anyone outside of it, which is a shame, I think. Or it sits behind a paywall, so you have to have a JSTOR. Shout out to Aaron Schwartz, but like most people don't have don't have that sort of access. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so um, pro problems remain, where, you know, in the availability of information around the world. But at least on a positive thing, things do seem to be getting better in that regard. And I think a lot of the time, just driven by ordinary people, just kind of researching stuff and writing it up, and then you know sharing on social media and then you know you can find out about it look into more and, and what have you and find more kind of things that have been digitized you know more texts that have been digitized around the place and the more of everything that's made available online and translated and stuff eventually the more that we could be able to find out about all of it but so it, it is kind of exciting seeing you know new things get to get digitized and put online um but yeah it's a kind of slow process like off topic a little bit but to the Google Translate thing, yeah, I mean, Google is a terrible company <laughs> in its application. But also, I, like, six years ago, I was in Istanbul, and I remember, like, I don't speak any Turkish, but I remember sitting in a cafe, and one of the workers came up to talk to me, because I was sitting and reading, and they asked me what I was reading in Turkish. And I was like, I don't know, like, showed them my phone, and, like, typed in, like, to Google Translate, to translate into Turkish, like, I don't speak Turkish sorry and they just put out their phone and they were like okay well i was wondering what you were and we just had, like had this conversation showing screens to each other and eventually got to see this like barista's like artwork that they wanted to show me that they had drawn and it was just neat to be able to have this conversation that would have been excluded if not for the fact that we had this intermediary technology standing between us it's kind of utopic if not for the fact that it's owned by a terrible skynet corporation that is trying to control all the library books and all the data everywhere. <laughs> yeah but you know i guess you could say at least 
their business model is more to let people use stuff for free and then just make money off our data and private information rather than I uh, <laughs> don't know if it's better or worse, but certainly we can make use of it more than like the other companies that kind of buy up historical images um, and then their model is to try and own all of the images and then make people pay to use them and so yeah like those yeah terrible terrible things capitalism is like it's bad it's like it's enclosing everything <laughs> no so have you considered making a working class history page in esperanto i'm just kidding you don't have to answer <laughs> <laughs> If someone would like to, to, to you know, if, if, if someone would like to take that on and, and do that, you know, uh, they are very welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> it's very diplomatic. I know, you know. Um, <laughs> I, you, we, we, we've got a bunch of stuff about that, you know, Esperanto has a, a, a really exciting and interesting kind of radical history. And um, sadly, um, a, a guy that we are planning on doing an interview about him, a guy called Eduardo Vivancos, just died a few days ago aged 100 he was a guy who um he fought in the spanish civil war in the deruti column uh, militia and survived the war obviously but he was also a, a very prominent esperantist who wrote and did a lot of uh, stuff you know spreading anarchist and uh, working class ideas in, in esperanto and was able to communicate with you know lots of people in china and japan and stuff in particular at, at that time so i think certainly like yeah a, a, a esperanto was a really exciting kind of utopian project at the at the time and has a really interesting history yeah it's really easy to point to like the limitations of uh like it being such a like a eurocentric language and and what have you like it's definitely an imperfect thing but the approach and like the desire to have some sort of universal tongue among peoples it's a really beautiful idea a universal tongue that's not distinctly like just english or german or french or spanish or or, or whatever else I know Radio Libertaire in Paris has a weekly Esperanto show that tries to teach listeners how to speak it, uh, which I think is pretty cool to see that still alive. I don't know. Yeah, because, I mean, just you saying that and, and, and think, yeah, you know, that is, it, the idea is really cool and, and really utopian. But I think, it, I don't know, like what, what kind of popped into my mind as well is also, I mean, also recently... Um, what is also about um, things like indigenous languages. So many languages are dying out. I say dying, kind of being eradicated essentially by colonialism and neo-colonialism, in particular with with the with the spread of English. So it is kind of heartening to see the. I mean, it seems like there's been a real kind of like a growth in interest in trying to, uh, particularly by kind of indigenous peoples to repopularize things like indigenous languages and um, and other languages that are dying out which i think is also really important because because on the flip side of kind of universal communication there's also that like because of how our brains work and stuff so much of the language we speak shapes kind of how we can imagine things and how our minds work and you know having languages die out is, is all those whole ways of thinking kind of die out along with them and which is yeah really mm -hmm. um uh uh, we, we, which is really sad the final straw radio is a proud member of the channel zero network of anarchist podcast and here's a jingle from another member of czn one two one two tune in for another episode of maroon cast maroon cast is a down-to-earth black radical podcast for the people our host hip-hop anarchist simile the rbg and sex educator and crochet artist klc share their reflections on maroon rebellions Womanism, life, culture, community, trap liberation, and everyday ratchetness. They deliver fresh commentary with the queer, trans, gender non-conforming, fierce, funny, southern girls, anti-imperialist, anti-oppression approach. Poly ad and bullshit. Check out episodes of Marooncast on Channel Zero Network, Buzzsprout, SoundCloud, Google, Apple, and Spotify. All power to the people, all pleasure to the people. Peace. This call is now being recorded. I want to make music that's important, not just for everyone, just music for kids like me to adore it. Adore it. Adore it. I want to buy a used hearse, put a sound system in it and floor it. If you're like me, you won't buy the song, you'll download it in a torrent. I want to make music that's all bars, no hook and no chorus. Fuck popular music and popular people. It's time for the emo kids to flourish. This call is now being recorded.
This call is now being recorded. This call, this call, this, this call is now being recorded. I said some things on Facebook I shouldn't have, and sure enough, it got the police showing up. Someone recorded me getting tased, and this is how I planned on blowing up. I just wanted to shed light on scrutiny. Got pulled over after speaking my mind, and now I'm worried about the police shooting me. I don't want to overthrow the government mutiny. I just want to change the bad things. Why are cops allowed to kill us? I'm just asking. Even though I'm sitting in jail, I'm glad things I've done inspire you. Never be afraid to speak the tired truth. If you're speaking your mind freely, then I admire you. We got Donald out of office. How's that feel? We fired you. We fired you. We fired you. We fired you. The rap you just heard was written by Lauren Reed in his Arizona prison cell and recorded during a phone call with supporters over a line actively monitored by the FBI. Lauren's a 26-year-old native man from Page, Arizona, who faces up to 10 years in prison for Facebook comments made in a private chat that the FBI and federal prosecutors have deemed threats. Lauren has been held in federal pretrial detention for eight months after the courts repeatedly rejected his request that he be released pending trial. Lauren is charged with one count of threats to damage and destroy a building by means of fire, which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. The charges stem from comments Lauren made in a private Facebook chat while planning a protest against police violence in his hometown. The summer's protests, which brought more people into the streets than any protest movement in U.S. history, have also led to a wave of repression against activists. Lauren is just one of the hundreds of people now facing repression. In the police and FBI's decades-long war against dissent in this country, the case of Lauren Reed is a battle they're certain they can win. The outcome of his case will have implications for Lauren's young life, but it will also have rippling effects on the social movements emerging so powerfully this year from the historical wreckage of McCarthyism COINTELPRO, the Green Scare, and the post-9-11 clampdown on dissidents. The wave of protests that emerged in Hong Kong, in Paris, in Beirut, and Bogota in 2019, and crashed down on American shores this summer, has led to a backlash this fall that threatens to roll back its gains. Lauren's case is evidence of both the ubiquity and power of this movement, and the extent to which some will go to stop it. Lauren was easy to target and easy to charge, and the government hopes he'll be easy to railroad into accepting a charge that sends a ripple of fear and paranoia throughout the country. Looking at the long history of FBI repression of political movements, one can only conclude they want us quiet and afraid. The case of Lauren Reed is a formidable tool in their continued efforts to intimidate and silence American dissidents. The outcome of Lauren's case is, at this point, uncertain. But we do know that much more than Lauren's fate is on the line. The powerful movements that emerged in the streets this past summer are now facing their inevitable plateau. Confronted by backlash, they can either grow to defend themselves or collapse. To learn ways to support Lauren and those fighting to defend him, follow Tucson Anti-Repression on Instagram or Twitter. So in the U.S., the last national regime uh, was pushing a program of patriotic education, attempting to reform and shape the inculcation of public school students away from influences of critical race theory and projects like the New York Times 1619 projects, as well as people's history a la the Howard's Inn, who you mentioned before. States in the U.S. have, with various levels of success, attempted to bar ethnic studies programs and to ban books like Zinn's. Can you talk about the approach of people's history, which you mentioned as being, or at least in name, at least a bit populist. And it's maybe like Zinn's work or Studs Terkel or other documentarians of working class experiences, how it's like influenced y'all in working class history and why you think the reactionaries find it so threatening, like that sort of approach to popular history. Yeah, some of the some of the stuff, especially being pushed by the last uh, government was uh, 
extremely worrying with their very kind of blatant um, attempts to uh, rewrite history, especially for like right wing people who like to complain about Black Lives Matter activists trying to rewrite history by removing some statues and they actually try to rewrite history by making a load of up and lying about it. It's, um, I mean, well, ironic <laughs> at the least, especially <laughs> as it's also so completely nonsensical that, yeah, I mean, it is good that there has been a real growth recently in more people-based kind of history, more kind of grassroots history, more black history, more indigenous history, you know, more, more history told from the perspective of, of black people, indigenous peoples, and so on. You know, and th that is great, um, and that th th so many people are, are out there doing that. But at the same time, you know, that idea in the right wing that these ideas or like Marxist indoctrination of school children is, is predominant in any kind of public education system is just such a complete joke that, I mean, it's, it's obviously not funny because it's extremely disturbed, but, you know, uh, <laughs> the fact that a lot of educational institutions pay at least a bit of lip service to teaching about slavery or the civil rights movement i think you know a lot of teachers and educators are doing really great work but in a you know in a lot of ways the way that history is still taught for the most part um is still very much kind of top-down eurocentric colonial um blah 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 so anyway that that's a bit of an aside but uh, but yeah uh, people you know people like howard zinn um was uh, r really um a big influence reading his book for the first time was very exciting and I think on a personal level I don't think I reali realized it at the time well I didn't realize it at the time but I read like War and Peace as a teenager by like Leo Tolstoy who was an anarchist but I also didn't realize that at the time and um, interspersed because the book's about you know the sort of war and all these kind of countesses and counts and, and whatever and it's really fucking long <laughs> but, but I, for anyone who has sort of hasn't read it or whatever interspersed through this kind of really long story is a kind of intimate essay about the nature of history and the, the thrust of it being that like history is not obviously napoleon or whatever is a great man of history but napoleon is not what has made this history happen what's far more important is the kind of infinitesimally small actions of tens of millions of people every single day that that goes to create what history is and i think when i read that at the time i th kind of thought it, it was a bit random that this essay was in here amongst all this sort of stories of you know aristocratic love and intrigue and, and everything but that actually stuck with me way more than the rest of the book i i think that probably had 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 a real impact on how i think about things later so so, so yeah it did have an influence on, on me personally and, and on wch kind of in general and for reactionaries yeah it is threatening because you know the idea that we as ordinary people have the power to make history and, and change society is the most threatening thing you know for the people who are in power now because what is in their interests is the kind of fatalistic idea which i think i don't know about most people but probably most people have at least at, you know at some time is that things are the way they are because that's the way they have to be and there's nothing we can do about it and um you know things will never change blah 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 which is obviously what people thought under feudalism <laughs> you know that the divine right of kings was something which could never be which was it was in the natural order of things and it could never be questioned never be changed but then when people realize that actually ursula Le Guin, who uh, was um, a legendary kind of anarchist feminist sci-fi author um, who sadly died um, a couple of years ago said that I can't remember the exact words. Yeah, I am paraphrasing. It's not a direct quote, so don't quote me on it. Any society that's made by humans or whatever can be changed by humans, which is, of course, true. I think there is some truth to the argument that they're rewriting history. Like, when we push different narratives, it doesn't mean that people are making up facts, but history is a narrative that, or a series of narratives that we choose to accept or that are accepted by institutions and that shape the way that 
we view ourselves and we view the society in which we live and a fundamental shift in in that way of adopting funnily this like view that two pacifist at least anarchist adjacent individuals like tolstoy and zinn had of the world i wouldn't call it cultural marxism like a lot of people on the right do i think that there that is that is like you say like that is does pose a threat to the way that the world is constructed and we can think outside of the the feudal bounds that we're stuck in now even yes (laughs) yes i concur along those lines there is the like rewriting of history but this isn't even necessarily part of it this is a byproduct of, of the fact that people are rethinking their relationship to historical figures who are in primacy in the historical framework the historiographies that most of us have have grown up in the u.s under in mainstream society it's been the history of great men to paraphrase gang of four and the breaking down of that the rethinking of these public figures who do have statues around whether it be christopher columbus or thomas jefferson or General Robert E. Lee or, you know, conquistadors or missionaries on the West Coast or not even just in the West Coast of the United States, but, you know, Cecil Rhodes or whoever, like statues have been toppled. Statues were at the center of of Unite the Right, number one in Charlottesville in 2017, August 12th. Um, It was a fight over statues and public representation. Similarly, throughout the United States South, there have been the toppling of other statues or monuments, either to individuals or to symbolic ideas of the Southern soldier, like facing North, ready to like fight back the siege and reimpose, continually impose white supremacy. Symbols like this mean a lot to people, like enough for people to fight over or to like struggle to destroy, to, to build something else. Like I'd be interested in hearing how working class history members felt during this last couple of years, but in particular this summer during the uprising up that took place in so many places around the world. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it was an exciting time. Um, uh, well, not, not to play down, obviously, it came out of um, horrific um, events, you know, the brutal kind of on-camera murders of uh, unarmed black men um, around the US. Not to kind of downplay the, 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 the horror of it, but the upsurge in kind of, you know, black-led, self-organized protest and militancy not just around the US, but um, but that also had an impact. I mean, kind of partly because of US cultural dominance of, of the planet um, in large part that um, also saw, you know, similar protests break out all over the world and as well as parallel kind of movements uh, in um, Nigeria, again, about police brutality by the colonial era police force. So on the one hand, there was the, 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 the Black Lives Matter movement. And then at the same time, from our perspective, it looked like a real surge of uh, interest from people in uh, radical history, people's history, um, the history of past movements and uh, colonialism and social movements and that, and that kind of thing. We had um, a massive kind of growth in new followers and interactions with, with our content that was uh, unprecedented, which was exciting for us as a as, as a history project but then also seeing how many of the kind of discussions happening were about history and the nature of history and, and, and the telling of it was interesting and kind of inspiring as well you know talking about the negative um, impacts of colonialism you know that's not something which i can recall being on the public agenda in my lifetime which is, you know, tremendously kind of significant. And then seeing the physical manifestations of that kind of top-down or bourgeois, if you want to call it, right-wing um, colonialist capitalist history in these statues of right-wing, rich, um, enslaving, genocidal, uh, you know, people. monuments have been built to these you know, I think, I don't know, these kind of statues, that they kind of say what our civilization is supposed to be about. That's what we acknowledge and revere is wealth, genocide, racism, colonialism and all that. And, and seeing those symbols being kind of toppled or damaged or just um, graffitied and denigrated. And uh, my favorite one was the Colston statue in Bristol of a, an enslaver in Bristol just being just being th- thrown in the river. Um, 
you know, chef, chef's kiss, you know, that was, that, 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 that was really sort of inspiring, um, to see. And then for, for some people on the right to complain about, oh, you know, this is rewriting history. It's like, you know, these things are happening because people have studied history, you know, and I mean, you know, in a lot of cases, their bodies and their selves, they've experienced and lived this history, you know, through, through their ancestors, you know, that, that kind of the trauma and, and so, you know, so they've, they, they possess that and, and, you know, and they know their history and the history has been studied and it's being talked about. And, you know, this is happening because of, because of the actual history of things, you know, the statue is not the history. The statue is like a, you know, piece of metal put up by some, some rich person. This, you know, this is, uh, this is being done by people who actually know the history. Um, not just who know, I don't know, whatever Tucker Carlson or some other right wing spews out about whatever and especially because so many of these statues as well were erected like in you know in the u.s south were erected by you know pro-confederate pro-slavery groups like the daughters of the confederacy literally in an effort to rewrite history and change the narrative about what the civil war was about to be about states rights states you know as opposed to the enslavement and uh, of, of human beings so um for all the um you know, it's it's an interesting time to be a kind of people's historian. Some of the stuff that happened over the summer really like reminisced of that. Like, and this is like an old. Well, I don't know how old it is. Like the two examples I can think of are as flawed as the invasion of Iraq was, as very flawed as much as I wish that it had not happened. Like the toppling of of the statue of of um, Saddam Hussein was a pretty powerful um, public image. At least I'm not sure how much it was organic and how much it was put together by the invading forces but or or the like decapitation of the statue of stalin in in budapest in 1956 that's a there's some really cool photos of that but people like their people like their uh their symbols and also people like destroying their symbols yeah well and, and also i mean all the, the right-wing hysteria about them is like absolute nonsense like i don't know if it, it, it if it was kind of seen over in, in over here in the u.s but um in um in in the uk there was this kind of right-wing counter protest to black lives matter that happened by these mostly fascists and mostly fascist nazis racist types and um you know from having you know been crying about oh Oh, they they defaced the statue of Churchill or, or whatever. Even though, you know, there's a lot of you. Can, I mean, and and you know that obviously you can say a lot of bad things about about Churchill or whatever. But also, Churchill did what was involved in a big war against Nazis. So <laughs> I'm not really sure that he's your boy as much as you think he. I mean, yeah, he was a racist, genocidal, um, anti-Semite. You know pro-fascist whatever but um but yeah um and uh, you know so so they had this big protest and then um but they got caught on camera like pissing on statues you know because the you know they're just they're just a bunch of drunk muppets pissing on the statues that um you know a couple of weeks before they were like oh look at these look at these thugs that you know writing like churchill was a racist on churchill's one or whatever being like oh that's outrageous and then they just go piss on them so mm. <laughs> So, you know, how, how, how real is the outrage? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I don't know. There was, I remember seeing footage of, um, of like a certain neighborhood in, in Philadelphia where just a bunch of Italian American people were out in this park defending a statue of Columbus because they were afraid that someone, that Antifa was going to come and topple it or something. But, you know, could be a few less statues of Christopher Columbus and some more statues of like Sacco and Vanzetti and Carlo Tresca and if you want Italian American statues. Yeah, totally. <laughs> a statue to Galliani. I would appreciate that more than like a statue to Frank Rizzo. I think they took that one down at least, but it was like a racist reactionary police chief in Yeah, for in Philly. I think that got blown up at least once or twice, didn't it? Uh I don't know about that. The maybe the ones that i remember being or the one that i remember being blown up that was to the police was the haymarket one the, yeah the haymarket one <laughs> which <laughs> i think that's great that's maybe the best thing the weather underground ever did <laughs> yeah also similar to um a, a statue of margaret thatcher was decapitated by a man with a cricket bat um when it was <laughs> unveiled um in england a few years ago that was a fun um brilliant that was a, that was a fun day <laughs> That's awesome.
back to the interview. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> so I've, I've been a fan of the Working Class History podcast for a while now. Would you talk about the work there um, and what you choose to cover in it? Um, and do you have any favorite episodes that stand out? Yeah, well, um, I, I, as, as I said, we started doing the podcast to try and look some more, more into some of these stories and, and in particular capture the voices of participants who took part in some of these movements and struggles to kind of learn from their experiences. And so we've been doing that for a while now. Um, in terms of what we choose to cover, we've got a massive list of episodes that we want to work on. It's like 160 episodes or something and constantly growing. What we are trying to do right now is prioritize producing episodes um, about social movements where the participants are kind of at risk of you know because of age not being able to but and you know sadly a couple of people that we had lined up to interview about things have, have have died recently before we were able to speak with them so we're trying to do a fair bit of stuff about struggles in the 40s 50s 60s and 70s right now for the most part but again, as with the rest of the project, we, we try to have a kind of diverse selection of different types of stories and movements. But we've got a couple of series, you know, where we, where, where we do it, that, that we're kind of working through. So we've got the kind of intermittent series on, on themed things. We've pretty much wrapped up now our um, a series about the Vietnam War, where we had a, a, a lot of episodes about that, including possibly, I don't know if it's my favorite one, but certainly one of them is a, a mini series about the Columbia Eagle Mutiny, where we speak with a guy called Alvin Glatkowski. He was a merchant sailor during the Vietnam War. He was working on a ship with a, a friend of his called Clyde McKay that was carrying 10,000 tons of napalm to be used by US forces in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And he and Clyde hijacked the ship at gunpoint and sailed it to Cambodia, uh, which was neutral. And his story is incredible. And um, he hadn't kind of been recorded telling that story before. And yeah, I mean, hear, you know, hearing him tell it and then being able to put it put it out was, you know, something that i uh, personally really proud of. And it's a great it's a great story and a, and a crazy story uh, as well. So, so, so that's, that's kind of a favorite um, for sure. Also uh, on the... Uh, 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion uh, in New York, where um, LGBT people kind of rose up against police harassment, uh, was able to get in touch with a few people who participated in, in the rebellion and um, were involved in the organizing afterwards, where people set up the Gay Liberation Front, which kind of revolutionized the LGBT rights movement. That was um, uh, really inspiring to you know uh, talk to these people as well a another occasional series we've got is about the the british empire and uh, we did an episode on the it was it, it came it was quite timely actually because it was while a recent wave of riots were happening in hong kong i met with a bunch of people who were involved or in the hong kong riots in 1967 uh, against uh, british occupation british colonialism and that was super interesting because i knew almost nothing about that before starting doing the research for, for for that episode so it was super interesting just to learn about kind of their experiences you know growing up in um british colonial hong kong you know especially because it's always spoken about quite widely as an example of british colonialism done well and getting to the the meat of that like <laughs> you know and because up until these riots took place you know, Hong Kong, I mean, it was a, tra a trading post, obviously, but also it had a large number of super exploited factory workers working in like really appalling conditions, making things like the factory where it all started was a plastic flower factory and things like that. And it was these riots in 1967 that were successful in substantially changing the nature of British colonialism in the country from a more kind of openly violent and repressive racist colonialism to i guess you call it i don't know a, a more kind of more friendly kind of hillary clinton style of uh, colonialism if you want to call it that and you know um, so even these examples people choose of colonial capitalism you know being not so bad or what have you it's not due to any it's not due to the benevolence or the generosity of the oppressors or exploiters or the business owners or whatever um it was due to the kind of self-organized struggle of the workers and the the the, the people in, in in that area so th th that was really interesting you know ch chatting to them as well and also 
in that one of the people that I was talking to kind of during during the riots there was like a really high profile murder of a kind of right wing um talk show personality and um that murder was you know it was kind of a notorious unsolved murder in in Hong Kong history and one of the participants in in the interview kind of basically told me who did it <laughs> and that was <laughs> and, and and that was quite like you know enough time had had passed and and stuff um not 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 the not not the name of the person because obviously they have um you know descendants who could but essentially the reasons behind it you know and that because I'm, I'm kind of a like a true crime buff like on, on my personal life it doesn't accord with my political views at all mm-hmm. um, other than that I do, everybody gets their guilty pleasures that's fine no exactly and a lot of the stuff i listen to is about you know miscarriages of justice and 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 and, and stuff like that um, but yeah i mean I, i'd say there's too many kind of i, I mean another, a, a really great chat i had as well was a guy called uh, Tarek mahmoud um who was a member of the, the the asian youth movements in 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 britain um who fought against racism um in the uh, 70s and 80s yeah uh, so i mean i, I yeah I'll, I'll kind of keep saying stuff those are the first ones that kind of jump into my mind right now i mean i'm sure i'm forgetting uh, but but yeah i I could, just, I could keep going but i won't i know y'all had taken a break at some point and so i i dropped off and, and he restarted it but the ones for me that really stuck out and i had to like do a little searching because it's been a while are the um the anti-zionism movement in israel i thought was a really fascinating multi-part episode there was the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit and sort of contextualizing that. And uh, just the Angry Brigade episode, I thought was really fascinating to hear voices affiliated with that. And the um, the Grunwick strike in 1976 that I had no context for that just sort of like opened up uh, a lot of conversation for me of experience of like workers struggle in the UK among immigrant populations. And like there's just a lot in each of those discussions and it's really easy to talk about like the context that they, you know, that you can grab out of that, that, you know, explains where we're at right now, explains like little snippets of these struggles that people have had that resonate with experiences that others have had. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed those ones. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, some of those early ones, cause th- those, those are most of some of our earlier ones where, you know, apo- for, you know, apologies for anyone to sort of listen, the, the quality of them isn't so great, but we have got better kind of since, since doing those <laughs> uh, from a, from a quality point of view as, as we've kind of learned, but yeah. And the, the, there was a reason that we did the Grunwick strike episode first because we thought that was important just from the kind of things that we've spoken about today because that was an example where this was a group of workers so they were east african asian women workers who you know self-organized a massive and militant struggle that lasted two years and were unfortunately defeated in the end because the forces against them were just too powerful but you know up until that point the british trade union movement was i'd say kind of chauvinist essentially the overarching thrust of the movement was towards excluding black and asian asian meaning south asian but primarily anyway workers and trying to kind of protect privileged conditions for their white members um, as opposed to organizing all workers and fighting collectively for better conditions and the women in the Cromwell strike kind of pretty successfully exploded that obviously there's still that kind of chauvinist nationalist current within the work but it's much more minor now worryingly it seems to be getting a bit bigger with it's unclear how really it is it's maybe more kind of twitter type personalities with bell ends like paul Embry, um who are trying to resurrect this kind of pro-nationalist idea of a traditional working class of like white blokes um as opposed to a you know workers um uniting together in our class interests but um you know that that strike really um successfully changed the general atmosphere of of the workers movement in a way that made um, working people stronger because of course we're stronger when we're united fighting against the employers when we're not fighting amongst ourselves over scraps so are you all seeking more help with the project you've talked about sister pages coming up and translation work if you are looking for more help in providing historical insights or translation work i guess like video editing what sort of ways can people participate there's all kinds of ways people can help out. The primary things that we need help with at the moment are things around fact-checking research and translation. So if anyone is up for helping with that, that would be amazing. Just get in touch. Uh, email us on info at workingclasshistory.com. And where can listeners find out more about your work and grab the book? 
Yeah, well, you can follow us on social media. Just search whatever platform you're on for Working Class History. You can listen to our podcast on every major podcast app like Apple, Spotify, whatever. Just search Working Class History. There's uh, links to all of our information on our website, workingclasshistory.com. And you can get the book on our online store, which is at shop.workingclasshistory.com. And all of our work is funded through our readers and listeners on Patreon, um, where you can also get the book for free, um, depending on your Patreon level, and access exclusive content and stuff at patreon.com slash working class history. John, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot for taking the time. It was really fun. Thanks for having me. And I hope that um, for the theme music for this, you can get the rights to A Gang of Four, Not Great Men, because I think that would be very appropriate. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? We're caught like a war! The following is a continuation of the segment that aired on January 3rd. The information was compiled by the website killedbypolice.net. Vincent DeMario Truitt. Alan Caleb Schultz. Glyn Fass Young. Christian Eliud Ramos Murillo. Julio Hamanjo. Tim O'Shea. Sean Ernest Roos, Taylor Blevins, Antoine Burris, Aaron Anthony Hudson, Chase Roundtree, Name Withheld by Police, Name Withheld by Police, Name Withheld by Police, Malcolm Camo, Darius Washington, Grant King, Vincent Harris, David Angulo, Jeremy Southern, Kyle Elrod, Deborah White, Scott M. Kontowitz, name withheld by police, John Carl Seiger, Dane Norris, name withheld by police, David Earl Brooks Jr., name withheld by police, Christopher Poor, Andrew Jacob Priest, Samuel Solomon Cochran Jr., Julio Cesar Varilla, Ray Adrian Lara, Jacob Wilbur Wright, Howard Owens, Juan Rene Hummel Jr., Winston Joseph Latour III, Jason Matthew Henke, Giovanni Sedano Amaro, Gary Hardy Jr., Gabriel Salinas, Colin E. Davis, Darian Walker, William Sears, Ronald Pope, James Justin Munro Jr., Russell Van Little, Cryas D. Carpenter, Adrian Stevenson, name withheld by police, Christopher Kimmons Craven, Melissa Halder, Raman Timothy Lopez, Andrew S. Gwynn, Ashton Broussard, Christopher Lawrence, David Lee Rigg, David James Pruitt, Roberto Hernandez Jr., name withheld by police, name withheld by police, Amir Johnson, Julian Roosevelt Lewis, Jeffrey Scott Hamsa Salathus Milvan Name withheld by police Nicholas Kokalis Anthony Baduk Name withheld by police Matthew Hildblink Name withheld by police Aaron Michael Griffin Jonathan Randell Donald Anderson Ryan Shane Hinoho Errol Barton Jr. Americo C. Reeds Jr. Jose Falejo, Joshua Squires, Robert Land, Chris Minor, Liana Gilmore, Kenneth Reese, name withheld by police, Raphael Havon Minifield, Joshua Gay, Daniel Rivera, Name withheld by police. Name withheld by police. 
Donald Timothy Miller, Kendrell Antron Watkins, name withheld by police, Rick Lee Miller, Fred John Henry Athira, Anthony McLean, Jose Manuel Castro, Thomas Moles, Jeffrey Hubbard, name withheld by police, Keith Allen Feliga, Evrado Gonzalez Santana, Santos Anthony Villegas, Jimmy Ferrer, Marco Antonio Singala Jr., Eric John Perez, Trevor Edwards, Adrian Jason Roberts, Jack Lamar Harris, Ronald Stewart Chipman, Samuel Mata, Name withheld by police. Jeffrey Ratton. Shiloh D. Smith. Nathan Harrington. Cesar Sanchez Roos. Scott Hoffman. Hansini Best. Trayford Pellerin. Christopher Walker. Brandon R. DeLusa. Mark Dawson Jr. Girl Leonard Williams. Corey Lee Cutler, name withheld by police. Casper Brown, Joe Middleton, Charles Garland, Damien Lamar Daniels. You can write to Sean Swain by addressing letters to Sean Swain, number 201-5638, Buckingham Correctional Center, P.O. Box 630, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. He has a book that is available from Little Black Heart Distro. His zines can be found online at theanarchistlibrary.org. And other of his writings and updates are still available at swainrocks.org. Sean has a complaint pending before the Inter-American Human Rights Commission for the torture that he suffered at the hands of the state of Ohio. He is also collecting letters of support for his bid for clemency. You can find more details on Instagram by following swainiac1969 or visiting the page for Sean on our website. 